Hey everybody, my name is Brandon. Welcome back to Cine Fashions, where we talk all things media. Different filming location today, really, just for the heck of it. I felt I've been doing too many videos in the same spot over the past month or two here, so I figured I would uh, change things up a little bit. Today, though, I want to give you guys my thoughts on three different movies that my wife and I ended up watching maybe a weekend or two or three ago, however long ago it was. Uh, we had a little mini marathon of sorts, and so I figured because all three of them were interesting, I guess, in their own regard, I figured we would talk through them today and give you guys my thoughts on three different films. So let's not waste any more time at all. Let's dive right into a recent watches video. So just to get this out of the way, yes, I have thousands of discs behind me and otherwise in this basement on physical media, but the three movies I'm talking about today all happen to be available on Netflix, and that is how we watch them. I believe two of the three are like Netflix originals, while the third one is available on disc elsewhere. So keep that in mind. That's what we're talking about today. So the first one we ended up watching is called Leave the World Behind from 2023, directed by Sam Asmail. This one stars Julia Roberts, Ethan Hawke, and Mahershala Ali, along with them, there is Mayala Harold, probably butchering the names, and I do apologize for that, but I thought this was excellently acted. Those are our four leads in this one. Basically, we have Julia Roberts and Ethan Hawke's character. They are husband and wife. They have uh, two teenage, uh, a daughter and a son, and they end up going to this essentially like an Airbnb, this beautiful house right outside of Manhattan, which is where they are from. They're from Brooklyn, technically. And so they go to this beautiful house and the first night there, they get a knock on the door and it is two strangers and they claim to be the owners of the house. So the first kind of mystery with this one is who are these people? What are they doing? Are they really the owners of this house? or what's going on here. Of course, all of the communication was done via email in order to rent this place, so they have no way of knowing who they're actually talking to. And the, you know, Mahar Maharshali uh, Ali's character ends up losing or leaving his ID behind and all these other things. So, of course, it's building up that kind of mystery aspect of it as well. But that kind of quickly sub go is put to the side because it turns out the reason they're there is because there was something happening in the city. There was a blackout. Something's going on the next morning after this whole big scene. There's this, this next morning. It turns out it could be a cyber attack. And things kind of pick up from there. It's it's really a what what is going on in this world? Who are these people? Why are they here? And what's going to happen next? What is happening with the world outside of this beautiful home that they happen to be staying in? So that's really what we're dealing with here. Like I said, this is an apocalyptic film, at least it feels that way. And as the movie uh, carries on, as it progresses, it really does start to head in that territory. So again, the acting in this one, I thought was really strong across the board, all four of our leads. It was really cool seeing Julia Roberts in this because I just don't see her in a ton of things anymore. And so it was awesome seeing her in this one uh, alongside Ethan Hawke. Who I thought Hawke was just brilliant in this as well. He plays like a, I think it's a college professor and he really has that vibe about him. It really reminded me of a professor I had in grad school. It was very similar, kind of the look and everything about him. And so I, I just really liked that character. But uh, that said, there were the uh, daughter and the son as well. The two teenage characters. Again, I thought they were really well cast thought they did a great job for what they were asked to do. Later on in the film, the son does get asked to do a little bit more because there's this weird thing that happens, which of course I'm not going to spoil any of these movies at all, but something goes on and he's, you know, asked to do a little bit more with his acting and he really holds up. He does a really nice job. Outside of that, we also get Kevin Bacon in this in basically a supporting role, a really small role, but very memorable for what he what he does in this. And I thought that scene with with his character I thought was great as well. Mahershala Ali is always great in everything I've ever seen him in, and he's excellent in this as well. And then the the woman playing his daughter I thought was really cool. Now, this ha had very kind of Jordan Peele vibes to me, or to it, uh, to me anyway, the way that they were handling the question of race and how this white family was handling these two African-American individuals who they've never met before coming to this house and saying they own it. 
very clearly a race message here, but I don't know that they really go far enough with it to kind of say anything about race in America or just kind of this situation. So I don't know how well that was played up or handled in this situation, but it was interesting nonetheless. And anything that gives me Jordan Peele vibes, like I'm down for. So I thought that was pretty interesting. It's pretty funny as someone who has thousands of physical media items behind it, talking about this film, which I happen to watch streaming, but really it's almost a love letter to physical media in a very small way because the uh, daughter of the group has been watching Friends and she's been streaming it on whatever platform it is that she has streaming. But when the power goes out, the blackout happens, she can no longer stream it. And all she wants to do is watch the last one, right? The very last episode of Friends. And it is eating her up inside because she can't do this. And so that's this whole subplot. Frankly, it's almost the plot of the movie, if I'm being honest. It's just such, it's so weird how that whole thing goes down. But of course, if streaming's down, what are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to disc. And so it's this whole thing with physical media in there, which I thought was pretty fun to watch as obviously a physical media lover and a physical media collector. But that part was pretty funny. I, again, I don't know what they're trying to say with it because this is a movie that is, as far as I know, not even available on physical media. It's only available through Netflix at this point. But it was interesting. But anyway, the real reason I didn't love this movie and honestly why I can't even recommend it is because of the ending. It felt so lackluster to me. And again, no spoilers on this if you do want to check it out, but it felt very cabin at the end of the world to me and specifically the book, not knock at the cabin, the movie, which the cabin at the end of the world is the premise for. Uh, the movie has a very kind of a, a kind of cut and dry ending, I guess. Like it, it, it chooses a path and runs with it, which I really like. But the book does not. And that's why this movie felt very much like the book, The Cabin at the End of the World. And I didn't love that. And I think that's why I, I liked the, that book a lot less than I might have, I might have otherwise. I understand having an ambiguous ending, but at the same time, like I want a choice. Make a choice as the filmmaker. And obviously the choice that was made was to leave it ambiguous, but there's so many different ways this thing could have gone that would have made it felt a little bit more fulfilling, a little bit more worth my time that I spent. And it was a long time. It's a five act structure. They have part one all the way up through part five. And by the time you get to the end, like you, I, one, like I said earlier, I was thinking to myself, man, there's a lot of things that really could have been cut out of this movie that probably could have made it uh, a little bit more palatable with that ending, even if they kept the same ending. So that part was disappointing to me. Again, you know, the premise is amazing. I love apocalyptic films, post-apocalyptic films. I love that premise. The idea of not really knowing what's going on. Is it a cyber attack? Is it something else entirely? Is it, you know, another country? Is it internal? What's going on here? And that part was was just fascinating to me. I was to so taken by that. But then by the time we get to the end, you see some action going on kind of in the background that they show, but that's really it. And then it just kind of, kind of ends. And it's like, what's next? Is there going to be a sequel? I would highly doubt it. But like, what, what happens next? And so uh, it's just, you know, there's never going to be a time where we are able to answer that question unless for some reason it does get a sequel, which I would watch, but I hope it's a little bit shorter, honestly. So this one, I, I just, I don't recommend it because I don't feel like the ending made the other 130 minutes worth my time. And when you get to the end and you feel that way, it just feels like you're slapped in the face. It's just not worth it. So I won't recommend it, but it's available on Netflix if you are interested in watching it. So I am going to give, I always forget the title of this one, so I need to double check it real quick. Leave the World Behind from 2023, two and a half out of five stars. This next one actually leaves Netflix by the end of the month of February. So if you're watching this when this goes live, check it out ASAP if you're interested in watching it. But this is Don't Worry Darling from 2022. And I had no idea as I was watching this, but it's directed by Olivia Wilde, who also plays a very prominent role in this movie. But it's led by Florence Pugh and Harry Styles. And oh boy, did I love those two together. I thought they were excellent. The chemistry between them was wonderful. It is a very uh, like sex sexualized movie. And I think they play that those roles very well. 
just the chemistry was there between them, which I thought was really cool to see. Uh, now, this movie is a real mind trip, in my opinion, and it's it's meant to be that way. Oh, let me also mention Chris Pine is in this as well as kind of the leader of this utopian society that these individuals are living in. So we have our husband and wife, which again is uh, Florence Pugh and Harry Styles. It feels like it takes place in like the 1950s. It is very much a the men are leaving to go to work every day. The women are staying home. They are the housewife. They're taking care of children if they have kids. And they are cleaning the house, making sure dinner's ready when their husband gets home. Now, our leading couple does not have any kids, but their neighbors do. So Florence Pugh's character goes and hangs out with them throughout the day when they get home from school and, and things like that. But basically... Things start kind of unraveling in this seemingly perfect society that these individuals are living in. Uh, Florence Pugh's character starts seeing things that she cannot quite explain, and she starts to kind of pull on that string a little bit. And when you start pulling on that string, things are going to go awry, because if you're living in this utopian society that is really headed by one individual, almost a cult figure in, in this case, Things just aren't going to go well for you, and that's exactly what happens here. It's kind of this degradation of this perfect society that we see at the start of the film. And I thought this one was fascinating to watch from start to finish. This is another one, when you get toward the end, I would have loved for something more, kind of the next step, but the ending on this one, I totally understand more so than the first one we talked about. And I really enjoyed this one from start to finish. Again, I think the acting was phenomenal. Harry Styles is great. I don't know that I've actually ever seen him in anything else, but he was great with this one. Florence Pugh is always awesome, and she was just as good here. And again, just the chemistry between the two just really made this movie work for me. As the story progresses, it's very much uh, the audience kind of in the shoes of our main character in trying to understand what's real, what's not. Is our main character crazy, or are things happening around her that just are un inexplicable. Like, what's going on here? This is a movie that I'd always seen the cover for it and the title, and I really had no idea what it was about. But finally, when we were scoring through Netflix, I stopped on it for a minute just to see what it was. And it's very much a thriller, which I didn't realize coming into. I thought it was just like a, a romance. And it's it has romantic elements to it, of course, but it's really a thriller. And it's done in a bit of a subtle way. And as the movie progresses, you just learn more and more about the society and this world that these people are living in. And I found it just so interesting to kind of peel back the layers of that onion to reveal what was coming next. So this one, it's not perfect. There are some, uh, you know, maybe some issues that you might find with it. But really for me, I had a good time with it. Like I can't sit here now, you know, a week or two later and really point to anything that I thought was bad about the movie. Yes, the ending maybe could have taken it a step further, but, you know, <laughs> I, I feel so hypocritical. Like, this one, it worked for me not knowing exactly what was coming next, whereas with the last film, I felt like it was the filmmaker not knowing what to do next. And that feels lazy, whereas this one feels intentional and it works just a, a lot better for me. So just kind of a tale of two endings here. Very similar in, in style, but one done much better than the other. And so because of that, I just enjoyed this one a lot more. This is a movie I would love to have on Blu-ray someday, so it has been added to my cheap Blu-rays to find list so that I can pick it up, because I would really like to watch this one again. Florence Pugh is just awesome. She is so beautiful, plays this role incredibly well, and I loved her with Harry Styles. Just a really great connection there. So thoroughly enjoyed this one. Olivia Wilde did a great job directing it. I definitely want to see more from her because she, like I said, she's in the movie and I thought she was doing a, a really good job in the film. Had no idea she was also behind the scenes with it. So I thought that was really cool to see. And again, I don't think I've seen anything else from her. I think she did Book Smart, if I'm not mistaken, which I think is behind me here somewhere, but I've not watched that one yet. So I definitely need to check that one out. But anyway, I am going to give Don't Worry Darling from 2022 Three and a half out of five stars. All right, so the last one today is the 2018 adaptation of Bird Box, directed by Suzanne Beer. So this is a movie that I held off on watching when it first came out because I wanted to read the book first, and frankly, I'm glad I did. I had to go back to Goodreads to check what my score was. I ended up reading the book back in 2020, and I gave that one four out of five stars. 
So in this instance, I definitely liked the book better than the movie. I can't say that I love either of them though, frankly. Uh, my memory says that I liked the book a little bit less than four stars as I'm uh, remembering it, but clearly I ended up liking it a little bit more than I thought. Either way though, this one we are following Sandra Bullock and these two children as they are trying to make their way to safety. This is a post-apocalyptic world. We are doing flashbacks. We start off in you know, five years prior, and then we jump to our present day. And so we're kind of going back and forth between present day and five years prior, and then leading up to that present day. So we find out what happened to kind of all the people that she was with leading up to the present day, and why is she just with these two children, basically. And so the uh, event that happens here are these creatures have shown up on Earth, and if you look at them, they drive you to commit suicide. And so, you know, so much of the world's population has just been offed because they looked at these creatures and they uh, ended up killing themselves. And so in order to traverse the world, you have to be blind. Essentially, you have to cover your eyes and not look at anything around you. You are relying on your, you know, uh, touch and sound, essentially, to understand where you're going and what you're doing. There are so many moments in this movie because of that being the premise that maybe it's because I was watching it being done on film versus reading about it in a book that I thought were just so utterly ridiculous that would never work, but yet somehow they were working for them. And so that took me out of it quite a bit. A couple moments in particular where they're trying to go to a grocery store. If you know, if you've seen the movie, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's just such a ridiculous scene that that would work. I don't know. So that bugged me quite a bit. And then the big thing, and I know this is, I'm going to be petty for a minute. And I totally understand that. I don't recall this being in the book, but maybe it was, and it just wasn't an, as annoying to me back then. But watching this now, Sandra Bullock never names the children. She calls them boy and girl. And it is the most ludicrous thing on the planet. I cannot stand it. You're going to give me creatures that when you look at them, you kill yourself. Sure. I'll run with that. You're going to tell me that, you know, all these other things are happening. Fine, I'll run with it. Whatever, I'll go with that. But not naming these children the entire five years that you've been with them is so stupid to me. Calling them boy, girl, and screaming boy, girl all the time. Like, oh my God, I hated that so much. Yes, it's dumb. It's petty, like I said, but I don't care. It bugged the hell out of me. And it made me like the movie less than it should have. It is so stupid to me. So just... Name the characters, name the kids, like, come on, it's, it's so dumb. So anyway, that pettiness aside, there are definitely some good things here. I love the premise of this. Again, it works better in book form because you're reading it as opposed to actually seeing these people do these things they have to do in order to survive when they can't, you know, when they're uh, in this blind situation or they can't uh, you know, look out into the world see where they're driving, see where they're walking, anything like that. And, you know, I know people deal with that every day, but it's just in this situation with these characters who have just been, this has just been sprung on them randomly. It's different. It's just, a, it's a whole different thing. So that was, was bothersome to me watching it versus reading it. But other than that, though, kind of moving past the negatives of this one, Sandra Bullock is great in this. I think the supporting cast does a really phenomenal job as well. Really no issues with the acting uh, in any of these three films. The two children, they're both five-year-olds. I thought they did a great job with what they were asked to do. But really, this is Sandra Bullock's film, and I think she does such a great job. I love that the first movie we talked about Julia Roberts, and the last one we're talking about Sandra Bullock. Like, I don't know why, but that just they, they seem linked to me for some reason, because these aren't the type of films I would normally expect them to be in. And so I love that aspect of it. But yeah, this is one I would recommend the book over the movie. But if the premise of the movie sounds interesting to you, maybe give it a shot. Another one that's not terribly short, but you know, it is what it is. John Malkovich is in this and he's such a good jerk in this movie. Oh, I just hated him, which you're supposed to. So yeah, this was, this was an interesting one. I just wish it was a little bit better than it ended up being. So I, I don't know. There's a, there's Bird Box Barcelona available on Netflix as well. And I might give that a shot. If they do Mallory, I think it's called, uh, which is the sequel in book form, if they turn that into a movie, I'd probably watch it. I've heard the book is terrible, though, so I have no interest in reading the book. But yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I, again, good, not great. Enter at your own risk. I am going to give Bird Box from 2018 three out of five stars.
All right, so those were just some recent watches that my wife and I consumed here over the past few weeks. Actually, we did them all on one Sunday. We just sat down and watched three movies, which is incredibly difficult when you have kids, as you'll probably know, just starting and stopping all the time. But hey, you got to do what you got to do to consume the media you want to consume. So here we are. Anyway, let me know what you guys thought about these three films or any other movies you've been watching recently based on what I've talked about today. Is there something else like Don't Worry Darling that you might recommend or something maybe that's a little bit similar to Bird Box but better? Let me know that down in the comments. I appreciate any and all support down there. So thank you so much for that. But as always, before you guys go, if you hit, hit that like button down below, that engagement really does help me out. So thank you guys so much for that. Thank you for watching. And before you go, I just want to encourage you all to consume some media today. I'll catch you next time.